Okay, thanks very much and uh, good afternoon and welcome. Um, so I've uh, prepared a, a number of slides covering really the whole uh, offer that we have in construction. Um, and so uh, the, the agenda, the broad agenda is, uh, is shown on the screen now. Um, so my, my name is Gabriel Staples. I, my uh, role is um, sector manager for construction, building services and utilities. So my response responsibility is really to make sure that the qualifications and assessment services that we've got are fit for purpose for you, our customers, and uh, also importantly for the learners. Um, the presentation which should take less than an hour, um, and we will bring up shortly a couple of polls that should, will, should allow me to tailor the content accordingly to, to your main business interests. For example, if we had lots of FE colleges, then we would uh, talk perhaps more about certain other types of provision and more private training providers would focus on uh, perhaps work-based learning. So uh, the aim of today then is really to give you a, a, all a, a customer update, specific update uh, on particular products and services for uh, construction sector, uh, to update on the changes to the products uh, and services, um, and to give you some, well, some detailed uh, advice about what's coming up. Um, and then there will be opportunities uh, either as we go or at the end to uh, respond to some of your particular queries that you may have. So uh, to start the qualification update, this uh, slide here, you can see that we've got, uh, sorry, the text is quite small, but you can see that we've got a number of projects we're working on at the moment, which are incremental change uh, projects to update to the latest national occupational standards. Now, as you're aware, we are for the MVQ in construction, we are dictated to by the Sector Skills Council, CITB, and they uh, uh, specify when their employer working groups have required a, a change to the, uh, uh, to the qualifications. Now, most of these, uh, most of the time, this happens when there's a major change to the working practices, and therefore the MBQ, the evidence that you get in a workplace, needs to be updated to reflect this. The changes happen quite frequently, and it does take awarding bodies uh, and providers a while to actually implement. Um, these are the 16, 17 uh, NOS projects that were, have been completed, and we are working on these now to hopefully launch in early 2018. Uh, so as you can see, there's there's some here that you, you may uh, deliver, some you may not, but really just to advise you that uh, the qualifications will be changing. Where there are new qualification numbers, obviously the approval will be transferred over and your your uh, uh, every, nothing should change uh, in terms of direct claims and so on. Um, but some of these changes may just result in a change to the existing qualification number, just albeit with a new specification issued. Uh, one particular change to highlight is uh, for the uh, BTEC Level 1 Award in Health and Safety and Construction Environment. Uh, this qualification, it's a popular qualification. It's, when it was launched, it was launched to improve the health and safety uh, knowledge uh, specifically for labourers, um, uh, because prior to that, there were no formal qualifications for labourers. So this qualification is one of uh, several, but it's, uh, it's approved by the CITB as a qualification that can lead to the green card for labourers. So it's very important qualification uh, I know many of you uh, deliver uh, both in college and as private training providers, and quite often it's it's lumped in with the um, uh, the initial induction uh, process to a larger qualification or program that you may have, whether learners are full time or or wanting to progress to an MBQ. Um, so the two uh, changes to highlight that we are implementing as soon as we can are these new two additional assessment criteria, and obviously the specification has to be updated to reflect that. So when we're adding the TQT, the total qualification time in, which is a project we've got to do, uh, the, the, the nominal time for this qualification has also gone down. When we add that into the specification very shortly, we will be adding in these two uh, new uh, assessment criteria. Following that, there will then be a change to the updated um, uh, uh, assessment workbook, the authorised workbook that you may use for this qualification to make sure that the, cover, the questions fully cover those two criteria. So there may be additional questions in that. Uh, also a reminder, we, we um, are about to put on our website, but the CITB have updated their assessment strategies for qualifications. Very very minor change, sort of tweaks from August this year. Um, and it specifically is a, a, a statement about thermal insulation. You may or may not do that qualification regarding the occupational competence of assessors. But more significant changes are coming from, uh, they introduced this a while ago, but it's only going to be implemented from January 18. There will be a separate um, assessment strategy for plant operations and controlling lifting operations. And it's really the changes are around um, addressing the, the problems that uh, the industry has had with 
uh, centres doing the exterior, uh, experience worker route, UPAR route, it's, it's sometimes known as. It's not something that we particularly supported or offered, but it was uh, it's really being, being very specific about the requirements of workplace observation and the testing for these experienced workers. Um, essentially, it's clamping down on any sort of uh, perceived poor poor uh, behaviour for, for the industry, for plant operations and lifting operations, which are all about using uh, very complex uh, machinery, obviously, so health and safety critical. Uh, the assessment strategies are on, on, uh, on the website. Um, anyone doing plant and lifting ops at the moment should still refer to the current one. Um, the new August 17 doesn't have those annexes for plant and, and uh, control and lifting, so you have to refer to those. Uh, remainder of the work for, for 2018, just as in summary really, um, there's a load of qualifications that you may be aware that are approaching their review date, either in December or April. I'm going through an internal process at the moment to ensure these are extended. Uh, there are one or two where the take-up is, is very low and we may have to withdraw. In any case of withdrawal, we would obviously always give um, uh, decent notice. And, and, and obviously, if you've got any feedback on any of those, then you can, can get in touch with me. As soon as a qualification is extended, we will send a separate email to the quality nominee contact uh, uh, in your centres. Um, so qualification, our strategy really is to, to keep offering any qualifications that underpin SACE apprenticeships. Um, as we know, apprenticeships are changing, and there's another section on that later that I'll talk in depth about. Um, <clears throat> but really, it's just a contingency to make sure we, we, whether they're in the new apprenticeships or not when they finally reform, to make sure we, you've still got an offer, uh, to an interim offer. Because as you'll see, the pace of change with the uh, uh, reform with the apprenticeships in construction is not as fast as the, I think the government had expected. Uh, TQT, total qualification time, I mentioned that's going to be assigned to all qualifications. That's an off-call mandatory requirement. Uh, another uh, type of qualification which you, as a private training provider, you may be less interested in, but I know that there's some uh, people who do full-time uh, delivery on the call. Um, we have new uh, technical qualifications that, from 2018 that are intended for post-16 learners. I don't think it's very clear from that slide, actually, sorry. So. Essentially, these are uh, covering some fundamental uh, subjects that for learners who are after 16 who still need a level two qualification, they're likely still in full time education in, or employment uh, or before employment, so educational training. Uh, so, a likely uh, market for this would be colleges. They're designed to not just cover the technical skill, to introduce them to those uh, uh, craft trades in a, uh, an off site environment but actually to, to also cover work skills, attitudes and behaviours that employers have given feedback that are, are so lacking in some of the people that come out from school uh, and, and indeed college at the moment, even if they have done a construction qualification. So it's really to address skill shortages, to uh, make sure there's a pipeline of willing and capable learners at 16 to 18 who can then go on to apprenticeships or directly into employment. Uh, they, they map to... Um, uh, any standards out there that are approved by professional bodies uh, for this curriculum for the for the 14 to 19 year olds and they also map to uh, the NOS where possible um, uh, particularly the underpinning knowledge of the NOS or those trades so they should be relevant uh, in terms of the qualifications they're all mandatory units uh, there's three of them carpentry brickwork painting and decorating so learners at 16 will really know what trade they want to go into they just need the training first um, so uh, e the structure of the qualifications are up on the screen now. Um, essentially, there's a bit of theory. Uh, there's a, a sort of heavy uh, uh, emphasis on uh, skills, so whether it's brickwork and blockwork, for example. Those are the two units covered. Um, or it could be uh, carpentry, um, uh, all sorts from uh, you know the, the pre and post uh, design phase. It could be um, uh, there's also a smaller unit on experience in the industry where they get to, to look at um, uh, what career options are available to them, uh, what's expected of them in terms of behaviours, and there's opportunity for work placements in that if you're partnering with an employer who, who covers that. Uh, the one change that, uh, or the one uh, thing to note here is, is that there is external assessment. That's a DfE requirement. <coughs> uh, there's a, it's a practical assessment, however, it's, it's very limited in terms of the amount of writing it requires, which is hopefully a um, uh, attractive to, to learners who may have had enough of exams um, and it's uh, uh, so it's uh, an, a practical task where they have to uh, do it in a supervised period so it's not perhaps as uh, quite as 
high stakes as going down and sitting in, a, in an exam, in a big exam hall, um, as learners may have experienced before at school and they may not have got on very well with. Uh, the next uh, qualification I want to introduce has actually been live for a few months now, but it's the, um, the, I won't spend too much time on it, but it's the new level one introductory qualifications, which are designed uh, not exclusively for post-16. These are actually in a range of sizes. They are graded um, and they are uh, designed to cover really for learners who don't yet know at that, at that stage what they want to do and to give them an introduction to the uh, construction sector. Um, they are, uh, they've got sort of personal skills, developing skills, and, uh, as well as um, uh, sector units, which are specific uh, units regarding, uh, relating to construction. So I'll bring the list of, uh, of units up. Apologies for the resolution of the screen, but it's uh, a choice that obviously they can make um, at school or at college or with a private training provider. They can make a choice uh, in terms of what skills they want to, to cover. Um, these we see that there's a, a fair bit of interest already and there's a, it's an ideal introduction before um, they get on to focus on a particular trade at level two. And it may well be this comes before the technicals, which I've discussed, or that comes before an, um, uh, an apprenticeship, or it may well be that the, um, uh, the, the, the qualification can form part of a wider study program with, for example, the BTEC level one health and safety in a construction environment, which is a qualification itself, which I've discussed, that gets you on to, um, uh, uh, to be a labourer in on construction site. Uh, I want to also just discuss uh, the BTEC Nationals. There are separate events for getting ready, getting ready to teach events for this uh, qualification. We've already had uh, uh, initial uh, sort of focus groups for this qualification as well. Uh, so the BTEC Nationals for uh, 2017, you can still use the, the run the old uh, version, um, but BTEC Nationals are, uh, are now live. Um, they have been completely rewritten. Every unit's been rewritten. Uh, we've removed content where there's uh, the, the, the units are underused. We've removed content that's no longer relevant. And we've updated the content to make sure it reflects current uh, work practices. And on this slide here, you can see the, uh, some promotional information, really, about um, uh, the construction of uh, the BTEC National, um, the benefits of BTEC Nationals in general. Um, and the fact that um, we have a, a proven track record of success with BTEC National and getting through to, um, uh, through to, to, to work and to university. Um, the, the changes for, for these, which uh, I, I, will, I will talk about a little now, these are uh, changed and updated really to, to meet DfE technical level measures. And these, that means that for 16 to 18 uh, year old learners who, uh, and, and it means it, it does have to be externally assessed um, and it's for learners who um, can either go into higher education after this, or they may well choose, and you'd hopefully hope, hope uh, particularly for these, that they may well choose and be able to progress into work. They've been specifically designed for technician roles, um, whether it's in design, building services, civil engineering, uh, contracting operations, technicians, and, and they can still underpin apprenticeships that they do currently. Um, so we hope that they will still be used for apprenticeships once the reforms happen as well, um, which we'll talk about a bit uh, a bit later. Um, the content, in terms of the content changed, is, is clearly the world's moved on since they were first written in 2010. We've got a specific unit on BIM, building information modeling on BIM. Um, we've got a, a better focus on design and the, the, to reflect the modern processes that are happening in the workplace now. Um, we've got a, a new unit on civil engineering and infrastructure. Uh, we've got a particular coverage of quantity surveying. QS wasn't particularly covered, uh, uh, not overtly before. Uh, we've got a new uh, new unit on quality control and understanding um, employer contractual and commercial requirements, because the feedback was that although the uh, the, the the learners may be certainly have the the theory, the under, underpinning maths and science, they were very green coming out of the BTEC National in the past. They've sometimes it's been said that they've been quite green, quite naive in terms of how things actually work on site. Uh, so they're sort of site savvy, the uh, understanding how contracts work and how uh, you deal with uh, customers in a commercial way. Um, units like, for example, sustainability, I mean, it's such an important topic that that's actually been embedded throughout the qualification. It's not um, it's not its own unit anymore. It's, uh, it's It regularly runs throughout. Um, a word about higher nationals. I'm not sure if uh, you deliver or not, but um, they're the obvious progression route from the BTEC nationals and they underpin apprenticeships as well. Um, for example, site supervision uh, apprenticeship. 
These are similarly have been updated. However, they're not externally assessed. They don't need to be for, for the uh, government measures for that. But they are designed to provide, they're still popular, they're designed to provide nationally standardised framework for degree progression and degree apprenticeship ent entry. Now, degree apprenticeships is, is uh, something that we'll talk about uh, a little later, but that's something that the government's very keen to push. And certainly the H and C and the H and D uh, do provide an opportunity to cover the first one to two years um, of, of that framework. Um, as you can see, the pathway lists here, we've got um, broad areas at level four, and then they specialise uh, into much more specific uh, at level five in H and D. Uh, so it's possible to be, become really quite specialist at level five, and that may substitute for the first one or two years of a degree, or it may be that they then top up with a degree after, after that. Uh, but it's certainly got um, recognition from a lot of HE institutions for that as a a sort of bridge between the, the level three, 16 to 18 curriculum and their uh, their degree programmes. Uh, so the next on the next section, I, I want to, um, and this is certainly not exhaustive, there's so much reform going on at the moment that I can't speak about it all, but this section really is designed to, uh, <coughs> excuse me, cover, cover um, a little bit about reform and highlight some of the main changes that are impacting on your, or likely to impact on your qualification delivery. Uh, the actual content of the qualifications and the funding routes that you may or may not be able to access. So uh, the, the main uh, changes that government have made is, is really around uh, through their the, the department, through the DfE, um, also skill through the SFA, but the, the, the main changes are uh, really with regards to the performance tables, getting entitlement funding uh, for the qualifications and that means that they have to uh, exist, they have to sit on certain lists, whether it's the, the tech award list, for example, for pre-16, the technical certificates, now those technicals I've just mentioned in the three core subjects, bricklaying, painting, decorating, carpentry, joinery, um, or or um, the tech tech level as well, level three, so the BTEC nationals. And so funding obviously for colleges, probably predominantly colleges and schools uh, will access this, but the funding for the um, uh, for these these learners who may well be full time, uh, will only be given if it's if it meets these DfE criteria, and in all cases they do require some synoptic assessment. They require um, uh, ex external uh, assessment as well, as opposed to um, the current uh, BTEC nationals, which the previous ones, which were uh, uh, assessed by um, inter centre assignments internally. Uh, Learn loans are still available for selected qualifications take up on that has been lower than I think the government anticipated. And the, the, one of the big changes that we're grappling with at the moment, in addition to changing all our qualifications to make sure we've got a, an offer on the on the lists um, and on the uh, for all the categories, one of the main changes that's coming up is the same with skill plan, which was quite a wide ranging reform uh, uh, report, uh, which has recommendations that the government have fully adopted. So this is for 16 plus uh, aged learners, and it and it really just covers the routes to employment and to uh, higher education. Uh, trailblazer apprenticeships, you will probably will have heard about that. Now that's already started. There are some trailblazers already going live. That reform is really quite a large uh, piece of work that has a massive impact on on you if you are delivering apprenticeships. And I've mentioned the degree apprenticeships. That's really something the government's trying to push. There's only a, a limited amount that peers can actually offer in that space at the moment, and we're obviously hoping with the higher nationals um, that we can we can at least in part uh, meet that uh, agenda. There's a little link at the below, and, it, and and you will at the end of this slide you will actually get um, uh, a copies of this sent out afterwards. But that link takes you to some uh, more detailed information on funding, what's available, uh, what the different lists are, and so on and so forth. Obviously, certain centres may have more flexibility with it, with this. They may be able to put together a study programme, which with uh, the English and maths requirement and the main qualification, adding up to 540 hours, it may well be sufficient for them to do a qualification that's not on the measures. Um, but for most learners, with uh, organisations with full-time learners, they're going to want to uh, choose qualifications that are on one or more of those lists. So to talk about the post-16 uh, technical education reform, the skills plan, Sainsbury skills plan, and, and <clears throat> how it's impacted, effectively there's uh, some information on the slide here. 
Uh, there essentially there's an academic option which is probably less less relevant for construction, and there's a technical option which is all about getting learners into work, um, giving them the technical knowledge, and there will be specific routes. Uh, in, and in construction, there'll be a, a number of pathways, but there'll be a number of routes across the curriculum for all providers, where the uh, the DfE will say, you know, it's uh, this is what the qualification needs to be, uh, and so on. Obviously, we are hopeful that certainly for level three that uh, our, our own technical level, our own BTEC national will be sufficient to meet this uh, requirement. Um, it's given that we literally only just updated it and it's got the backing of employers and professional bodies, uh, it would seem to make sense that for certain technician roles that the BTEC national would, would meet that technical option, but we are still waiting for the, uh, for the government to come out with detailed criteria. One of the first routes is the building services and engineering route. Uh, we yet to find out exactly for which job roles that is, because obviously building services engineering could cover everything really from plumbing to heat, heating, ventilation, aircon, uh, generic design technicians and so on. Uh, there's a note at the bottom of this slide that work placement, you have to do very, very large work placements part of this. And that's one of the challenges, particularly for construction. Um, getting uh, providers uh, uh, to work with employers who will supply them with their learners with a large amount of hours of presumably unpaid work experience uh, during the course of this uh, technical qualification is really quite a challenge. I know that there's some resistance to that in the construction sector, um, but I think that's certainly something to be uh, to be aware of. So on this next slide, we can see the, um, the two uh, options, uh, the two routes. Um, and what you'll notice here is that um, there may be bridging in the middle, there's this bridging provision which may uh, get someone from a, a pre previously academic route across to a uh, technical route. Um, it may not be as high as at level three, it may be lower. And in the next slide, oh, uh, apologies, it's a slide after this, but uh, in, in the overview here, we've got um, uh, a quick summary of the routes and the pathways. I've already mentioned building service engineering. That's going to go live from 2020 once we know what the requirements are. Um, and these technical routes are going to basically probably further whittle down the numbers of qualifications available to uh, centres who want to deliver uh, qualifications in this category. Uh, so an example of bridging uh, provision here. Uh, we're working with the CoLab group and a number of colleges on uh, we've just launched a uh, qualification, well, a, a program that's designed, it's actually at level one, really, and it's designed to get people up to their first technical qualification. These are likely to be post-16 learners, still, even though it's a level one. And you can see, uh, in this slide, you can see <clears throat> how the qualification is intended to look. So it's uh, Build UK representing employers. Uh, it's um, CoLab Group representing uh, pilot colleges. And it's designed to introduce a bit of everything with local colleges according to their need, selecting the type of skills and training that they want. So there will be a curriculum underpinning this. It will also cover work, work skills that will also be achieved as, uh, during this uh, qualification. And it will only work if employers pledge the work experience, uh, work placements to go along with it. And that's where Build UK have obviously come in and, and they're trying to ensure that their members can engage with this. Uh, it's designed that uh, at the end of it, they would actually get a, at least a trainee card, CSCS card, uh, or at least a labourer's card. Um, they will achieve the level one beta health and safety in the construction environment as part of this. So it, if nothing else, it will lead to the level one qualification and the work skills and some readiness to work at level one. And ideally, it would then progress on to uh, apprenticeships, or further training a technical qualification, as we've mentioned, or directly into employment. Uh, so this, this would take place in under a year, and it uh, covers all sorts of uh, uh, a very large curriculum that employers have looked at and, and, and defined as being important for learners to, uh, to, to cover. So uh, I can't talk too much about the reforms, uh, not least because I'm not the most clued up on it, but there is a, a further bit of um, reading here on the links here, and you will get sent this, uh, these slides later. Uh, so the next part, I'd, I just want to focus on apprenticeships, and I think you will now uh, shortly have a um, uh, access to a slides 
So I'll just give you a minute to uh, for that to play. Thank you. So you should now have uh, access to this document to browse through at your leisure. Uh, we will be sending this out separately. Uh, but really, it's just a reminder, a summary of everything in terms of the SACE apprenticeships that we have available at the moment and the qualifications that go into them. As you can see, there's still a very large number of pathways covered. Um, and as we'll explain uh, later, um, uh, it will, um, as will, it will become evident that, that actually the trailblazer reform agenda has not yet uh, sort of cracked this particular nut in terms of getting these changed over. There's still a long way to go to, to reform them. Um, so I'll give you another minute to, to have a look through this, uh, this document uh, before we return to the slides. Uh, so this, this slide here is, is really just to summarise some of the changes between uh, the Saints frameworks and the new, new standards. This is probably not news to, to, to you, uh, to most of you. Um, really the key things to, to highlight, to pick out, are the fact that there is um, a, a recognised point of the gateway point, once you've done your training, where the employer and the provider uh, confirm to the whoever the awarding body is, uh, that they are ready for endpoint assessment. Whether you're involved in endpoint assessment or not, you may well be involved in the uh, initial uh, training and even the qualification, if there is uh, one covered, uh, to get learners. Your aim as a provider is likely to be to get learners to that point of endpoint assessment. Uh, <coughs> there are specific requirements around, um, well, uh, there are no specific requirements about qualification, but there are specific requirements still around maths and English and behave, assessment of behaviours. Uh, but that's something that we've, uh, providers and even awarding bodies have particularly struggled with, the notion that um, uh, there are no qualifications as mandatory uh, necessarily. Some of them do mandate qualifications, but the, the government have been very um, keen to uh, make sure that uh, it's the, if the employers do not need or recognise a qualification, then it will not be included in the standard, which can make it quite tricky uh, for, for learners to, to be assured that a learner has got to the same consistent standard and that in itself is, is posing some problems. Uh, in terms of uh, construction apprenticeships, uh, in summary, as I've, I've mentioned, um, well, the, the government is, is, is phasing out some, some very niche and specialist uh, SACE qualification frameworks have disappeared. However, really in construction, most of them are still, are still live. There is a link there where you can look at the, the latest list of, uh, of SACE frameworks that have disappeared. Um, there are, in, in conjunction with that, there are new frameworks, uh, some that weren't previously covered, uh, which um, are very specialist and they have launched in construction. I say very specialist property maintenance, perhaps less, less so. Uh, there are several in utilities. Uh, there are uh, the technician frameworks that Pearson offers in, in the civil and building services technicians, they have now gone, gone live, uh, though I don't think they've been delivered yet. And there's some new specialist ones such as rail design and transport planning, which are live. <clears throat> so in terms of Pearson's offer, we have a limited offer for the new standards across uh, where they are available. Um, one of the examples where we are offering is in the utility sector for smart meter and installer. And we work with uh, a large employer on that. But as I said, Development progress is really been, has really been quite slow and there's real concern in CI2B and in the employers and in providers and awarding bodies indeed that the development has been so slow uh, that obviously we're getting to a critical point where, you know, uh, the government says we have to switch over to the new standards and yet the trailblazer frameworks are not yet signed off. The difficulty seems to be between certain trailblazer employer groups and meeting the government requirements and the back and forth that goes on with the review and approval of the standard. The standard itself can get through, but the assessment plan quite often, uh, there's a snagging point at the end there. So uh, many standards that are in draft form, uh, they can be about, uh, they are listed on the government's, uh, the BIS website for apprenticeships. You type in BIS apprenticeships in Google, you will find the, the, uh, the, the new frameworks all listed there <coughs> and their status. Uh, many of these standards, Helpfully, are still specifying MVQ because the, the employers still uh, still recognise and value the MVQ in, in providing a consistent way to to uh, confirm competence. So we anticipate that there should still be a 
a role for the training provider for the FE College in, in providing uh, qualifications that you're, you've been used to delivering in the past. Uh, in terms of the uh, mapping, of course, we've uh, for construction apprenticeships, um, what's important once they are live is that you as a provider have an opportunity to uh, tender uh, or pitch your, your offer to employers because employers now are in the driving seat. They are the ones that own the, uh, the purse strings. They are paying a levy for this uh, and they can specify, they can source providers according to what they want. That may well be a tender process. In your pitch to the employers, if you are approved to offer a qualification that maps the standard, then you can legitimately say, even if it's not specified, you can legitimately say, we would offer this qualification, it's high quality. The learners will achieve a, a certificate at the, end, at the end of it before they do endpoint assessment. Even if you don't have an interest or, or uh, not engaged in the endpoint assessment part, you can still pitch for, for on-program business using qualifications if they map. And we expect there's a large number of our qualifications which will map to the new standards once they're signed off. We've not completed this work, but we are, I've given, certainly got um, a good summary of uh, where we are at with this, this mapping work and how our qualifications can actually meet the new apprenticeship standards. And I'd like now if Inset Online could bring up the second of today's documents for you to look through. Um, I'll give you a, a couple of minutes to look through, as you did before, uh, this whole uh, a document and it's probably worth as you look through uh, I can probably highlight a few bits um, and obviously we can cover questions at the end if, if necessary if uh, you need to uh, sort of deeper look at any particular standard. This document is in two parts there are um, uh, uh, so the first section is really where there's a like for like replacement um, uh, or it's going to be going to be uh, available soon. Um, and that's where there are, so I've started with the qualification on the left hand side, you can see which framework is currently in, what the new standard is called um, and what the new qualifications are specified in, in that. Um, you'll see some for example if you look down to um, the second page there's a controlling lifting operations MVQ and plant operations MVQ, they are currently two separate frameworks within the new, uh, there's a new uh, 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 trailblazer apprenticeship which is um, in development that actually requires the achievement of both the MBQ in plant ops and the MBQ in uh, controlling lifting operations. This is for a, um, a lifting technician. There will separately be a plant ops but obviously that shows you how you know the, sc the scope and the potential of offering qualifications if you are approved to offer MBQs that is two MBQ qualifications that the apprentices will need to achieve before they can get to endpoint assessment. That's as they're proposing it now. So as you can see, there are clearly still there is clearly still scope for providers to uh, to offer uh, apprenticeships in the, when they're reformed. Uh, if you uh, look through for the um, in terms of the second one, so page one, two, three, page four, uh, you can see that there are a selection of new occupations, new frameworks where they weren't previously covered. Um, I don't think there's any error. I have gone through this just to double check and this is where uh, the standard really is new. Nevertheless, there are still uh, existing uh, qualifications or in some cases we developed new qualifications for the example for the transport planning technician. Uh, so there are still existing qualifications that can meet the, uh, the standard even though it's a brand new, uh, uh, brand new occupation that wasn't previously available. Uh, for those of you who are delivering the um, higher level apprenticeship frameworks with the HNC, you'll see on the last page there is um, uh, qualifications, uh, site engineer and technician. Uh, obviously on the previous one there's also uh, site supervisor which is still still in development but that's nevertheless that will we expect that to uh, 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 to still still cover and an HNC can still cover the knowledge of that. It would be down to you then as a provider whether you think if it, because the MBQ in site supervision clearly is, is, is a good match for getting the evidence for that qualification for that apprenticeship but it would be down to you as a provider to pitch that to the employers that the gen in general the qual the higher level uh, trailblazer frameworks are not specifying particular qualifications so it'd be down to you if we can show the mapping and we will we will complete this work but if we can show that it maps 
then you can use that as a tool to uh, uh, to bring that um, to pitch that to the employers. Uh, so this uh, slide here is actually a bit of a repetition. So the, the this is a summary uh, of uh, how the apprenticeships are changing. Uh, I've got a, a short section on on funding. Uh, just really to clarify, to highlight what, what I've just said regarding whether qualifications are, are included or not, you cannot use uh, apprenticeship funding. This is this is specifically about apprenticeship funding. This is not about um, funding in general. You cannot use uh, funding, apprenticeship funding, for any costs um, if they are not mandatory in the standard. So whether they're regardless of the mapping we've just talked about, if it's not mandatory, then you can't. The funding cannot be used. The employer's funding cannot be used for the registration fee. That means that it will have to be covered somewhere, but it may well be in your pitch to provide the overall delivery of the qualification that that cost is absorbed somewhere along the line, either by the employer or by yourself, if it seemed to be a, um, uh, uh, an attractive option to have a qualification. Where it is mandatory in, in the standard, and some of them are mandated, then yes, your funding will, cost, will cover everything. It will cover the awarding body registration fees. Um, the actual, so it, just to, to reiterate, if the qualification is actually mapped, is it show you that it, you can show that it covers the uh, the standard, then the delivery of that qualification can be the funding can be used for the delivery of that uh, qualification. Uh, a, a little note here on the gateway, the assessment gateway point. Uh, the uh, clearly the um, this is a new point, and the government's been very keen to emphasise this that. Uh, Really, it's likely as private training providers or colleges, you'll be responsible for getting learners to this point. And it's really a, is a, a, a key moment where you confirm with the employer, perhaps to the awarding body who's, who's then going to offer an endpoint assessment, you confirm that the employer, the, the, sorry, the apprentice has actually got, the, um, uh, got to the standard, they've met the standard, they are ready to be assessed. Because what you don't want is to set learners up for failure and to, to make sure they're not fully prepared for the endpoint assessment, which is really seen as quite a high stakes um, end uh, service where they will, they will actually uh, do all their training and then they have a period where they are, a window period where they are eligible to, to, to enter into their assessment. And they, those endpoint assessments may be a, a written exam, they may be... Um, a skills likely to be in construction, a skills test that's observed, um, but it's separate to, you wouldn't be able to bring in any portfolio evidence from before, it is quite a separate process. Um, so getting learners to ready to that point is something that you as a provider will need to be, uh, make sure you pitch to the employers that you you know, you are capable to uh, of getting learners to that point. Uh, in a bit about endpoint assessment, which is obviously one of the, the big new uh, sections, the um, Excuse me. The uh, two models here, uh, direct delivery, um, where you uh, or the employer will actually buy off-the-shelf endpoint assessments uh, from uh, uh, from an awarded body or an approved uh, provider for endpoint assessment, uh, and then the um, uh, partnership delivery, where we may work with you as a provider and contract in. Uh, competent assessor resources. So you may have worked with the, uh, you may have a contract with the employer to train the learners to that standard and get them to endpoint assessment. We may then work with you in partnership as long as there are particular uh, standards and, and rules in place about contact with, uh, uh, with assessors. We may approach you and you may agree with us that you will buy our endpoint assessment, so it may be a test, an online test, for example, or uh, item or written exam that we provide, you can then administer that. Now that, uh, that's obviously subject to particular rules um, and the, the employer would have, to, uh, would have to be happy that you are, you are doing that. Um, and the uh, government rules are that if you're using an assessment personnel for endpoint assessment, they can't have had previous contact with the learner. So clearly there's a uh, You'd have to be careful about which cohorts uh, have contact with which assessors. Either way, we would, as endpoint assessment organisation, we, for example, Pearson would, if we're on the register, we're offering an EPA, we're selling it to you as a centre to give to the employer, as employers learners. We we would have to be, make sure that you are running that endpoint assessment in in, in, uh, in line with our standards set. 
So if, for example, we may provide assessment tools, the specification for the endpoint assessment, the design of it, a question bank um, or uh, the resources, and we may give you standardization training, assessor training, the actual delivery may be uh, using your personnel if that's a partnership that we uh, are involved in between you and, and us for a particular standard. So that is uh, something that's, that's uh, possible. And just to show that we've, we've thought about this process and we, we have started to uh, implement such a process, we, uh, the, if you're interested in partnering with Pearson in terms of you've got an employer, for example, that's come to you, they want to uh, completely outsource their apprenticeship, they want a provider to train the learners, and they want an endpoint assessment with a, an approved body, which we are for a number of standards. Um, then that's something that we can consider working with you on if you're, you've got that contact with the employer. Uh, so you'd go through your account manager. Uh, there is a particular form to, to express your interest and to get the information from you. And we will then uh, set up and establish if we are uh, able to work in that way. It may be, for example, that you, your discussions with employers have got uh, gone down the line and you're, you're, you're quite close to starting to enrol apprentices but there's still no endpoint assessment provider. If we've got a firm statement of intent from you and we know when these schedules, are, in terms of scheduling, we can cope with it and we know when the learners are likely to be ready for endpoint assessment, then we can develop endpoint assessment uh, subject to you know, in the internal business case going through. So this does allow us to um, develop our APA offer and to schedule this in because it's very resource intensive um, and it would obviously need all the necessary signed contracts and so on. So uh, here's a uh, sort of live example. Um, uh, we're working at the moment with British Gas, um, and uh, really there's two types of how we interact with British Gas. The, for the smart meter installer, the sort of type one is, is where we fully collaborate with British Gas, and it's their own assessors, in fact, that um, we approve, we standardize, we train. We provide the assessment instruments to them uh, and the specification for the endpoint assessment. And we're involved in quality assurance, but they actually make the assessment decisions themselves, and we then effectively QA it afterwards um, before we can finally confirm that they are, they have passed their endpoint assessment. So that's uh, that's a process that um, really does uh, involve full cooperation, collaboration between us. In the second example, for customer service, which is not construction related, but we work with them for a couple of standards. Um, customer service being the other one. Uh, this is where that we they fully buy a endpoint assessment service from us. Um, we recruit our assessors. We're responsible for sending out that assessor. Uh, we don't use any of the internal staff at all. They book them in. We've got the registration system set up for that. They book them in for their assessment. We then send it out. And in that second, well, in, in both of these examples, in fact, there's not really a role for a private training provider here. Uh, it's because British Gas are big enough. They're wanting to cut that out and actually go straight to the endpoint uh, assessment provider. But however, you can see at the bottom of the potential partnership delivery model here, uh, you can see here that we've got um, an example of, of, for example, property maintenance operative. Uh, we haven't got a live offer for this, but we are on the register for, of endpoint assessment organisations. Now, this is an example where there could be partnership between, the, as I've described, between you and, and us. The assessment plan, it specifies very clearly the role of the training provider in getting that learner to the uh, endpoint assessment, to the gateway, and how the uh, awarding body interacts for this property maintenance operative standard, how the awarding body interacts with, um, uh, with the provider and the endpoint assessment uh, organisation, which would be us, um, to actually uh, uh, provide the employer the service. So the employer really is, is buying the whole service. It's not really got much involvement at all. It's likely in this model that as a provider, if you've, you've trained them to the standard to get them to get to endpoint, you may well be going into their premises anyway uh, to, to do that assessment and using our endpoint assessment test specification and our test items, uh, we may well work with you to recruit assessment staff and, um, and issue the test. But we would effectively approve you as an approved centre to offer the endpoint assessment and any on-programme element. Uh, so that's something we'd be certainly be keen to hear from you on. We've had some discussions initially with other providers. If you think there's employers out there that uh, do have a, a need for a property maintenance operative standard and would be willing to, to work in this way, then that's something that we can, we can look at. I should note that for property maintenance operative, there is a 
building uh, uh, multi-trade repair and refurb operations, MEQ you may be aware of, that uh, qualification is um, uh, could potentially match this uh, property maintenance operative standard. But when you read the standard, you'll see it's more perhaps uh, uh, aimed at those who serve, they're not particularly construction specialists, but they service a range of uh, uh, maintenance, uh, deal with a range of maintenance issues, and they may be permanently based in offices in large, large sites, um, quite different to a building maintenance multi-trade operative who will specialise and get a CSES card for that particular occupation. So uh, finally, really just to show my uh, contact details on the screen here. Um, obviously, if you've got any questions now is the time. If you use the chat function, you're able to, to do that and we can uh, we can cover that. Um, but if you've got more um, uh, queries, then please do get in touch with me or the subject advisor, uh, which may well come back to me eventually, the query. Um, anyway, and if you've got any uh, queries about tra further training, then please click on the links below. Thank you.